every once in a while people will, you know, say glad that you, you know, thank you. And uh, there's so many of them that don't know anything about it or still don't know what it's going to be, what it was like, really. Nobody in this country that's never been there will never understand that you can have everything destroyed like that. My uh, dad was a blacksmith and a horseshoer. We moved around quite a bit. We did also lived on a farm, and I learned to do things at the farm. But uh, uh, when we finally moved to town, and Dad still had a blacksmith shop, uh, when I turned 16, I quit uh, school, and I started helping in the blacksmith shop so that uh, I could learn that trade. Uh, we also could uh, shoe horses and we worked on wagon wheels and uh, did all kinds of things like that. Mom, she was always uh, a mom at home and that's how we grew up. And on the farms we'd have big gardens and everything like that. Fear, failure. Only a few years ago these stalked the nation. Depression haunted America. The Great Depression, did that impact your family a great deal during that time? Not really, you know, because Dad uh, run the blacksmith shop and you could almost always do something to uh, uh, make some money, really. Uh, you didn't get much for doing it, but Still, you was doing it that way. And uh, as far as I know, they never was on WPA or anything like that because we usually had a garden and everything like that too. So it didn't really uh, bother us as much as a lot of other people would have been. You have the confidence and the gratitude and the love of your countrymen. We are all with you in the task which enlists the services of all Americans, the task of keeping the peace in this new world of ours. I was drafted. I uh, took the oath in November of 1942. The first time that I went to camp was at uh, Scott Field in uh, East St. Louis. And, uh, in that, in that camp, um, they try to decide where you would do the best in the Army. And uh, the guy that was interviewing me, I told him I wanted to go to the horseshoeing school. And he said, uh, you'd make a good uh, Jeep driver. I said, I don't want to drive a Jeep. I said, I want to be a, go to the horseshoeing school. In December, we uh, ended up in, um, just before Christmas at uh, Fort Riley, and January 1st, we started basic training. Prepared to accept his responsibility to protect and defend his nation and those he loves. That is the soldier's mission, a mission which has never changed. From the moment he is handed his rifle in basic training, the modern soldier begins to accept his first responsibility. He must learn, and learn well. The, cal the horse cavalry was still there at the time, and we would go down and ride the horses, uh, not every day, but uh, I think five days out of the week. And uh, we had to take care of them uh, in the stable and the stalls and everything and uh, learn all about that. We were also uh, trained for the rifles and the machine gun on the rifle range. And they did fire a pistol off of the horse. And is its greatest asset. Therefore, cavalry habitually moves mounted. However, its principal fire weapons are designed for dismounted use. Before resorting to dismounted action, the cavalry leader should use his horses to carry his command as far forward as practicable. 
Protected by a covering force, the troops are moved to a covered position from which to initiate the dismounted attack. Going from mounted to dismounted action is a deliberate movement. About the 1st of March, uh, they shipped me over to the main post and I did go through the horseshoeing school. It took 12 weeks to go through the horseshoeing school. I think there was like maybe 15 or 16 of us going through the school. But anyway, when that ended, um, they shipped me to Fort Bliss, Texas. And uh, we never did lead the mules. They, they were herded like um, cattle would be, but they would follow a mare that had a bell around her neck. And uh, so that's the way we trained them. A 1,300-pound mule, fresh from the farm, has a mind of its own, as the soldiers soon find out. It's difficult to imagine this fellow under army discipline, but give him time, he'll learn. In October, uh, they told us that uh, we we're going to ship out. So everything was packed on a train. This is the mules, the men, all their equipment, uh, the horseshoe equipment, the saddle makers equipment, everything was loaded on the train. And we went to New Orleans. And they had just prepared a ship for us. And it was a Liberty ship. And uh, the, the mules were loaded on the ship and all the grain and everything and it was loaded on the ship. And uh, we sailed out of the Mississippi uh, River and uh, we were going around uh, Miami and uh, there were two torpedoes showed at us. They both exploded right beside the ship. even busted light bulbs down in the, the restrooms and that. So there's something else happened and we had to pull into Miami and get repairs to the ship. Then we went up to, after that, we went to Norfolk and joined the convoy. Uh, and we was going with the convoy across the northern seas and we run into a storm. The storm must have lasted uh, at least a week. And the Liberty ship has a flop bottom, but the uh, lifeboats were hanging out on the side because of the mules being down there. And the lifeboats would even dip a little water once in a while. It was really a rough scene. Seaplanes on the stern of the USS Massachusetts are wrecked on their launchers. The USS Indiana, one of the battleships hit by the storm, fights the heavy seas. The majority of the ships damaged were quickly repaired and put back in action. This is the second time in less than six months that the third fleet has been damaged by a typhoon. The first storm striking 18th December in the Philippines. Anyway, in February, we started, uh, we was uh, shipped going to Alito, and this is just uh, where we finally start up the Alito Road they're building. China has been fighting the Japs since 1937. Manchuria had already been occupied without Chinese resistance, and now Japan began to seize China's ports, walling her off from the outside world. The isolation of China was completed. Then Japan set out to chop its victim in two. To 
stay in the fight, China had to have help from us, her allies. But her ports were gone, sealed off by Japan. And the only way we could supply the munitions and other help so sorely needed was to break down the wall, reopen the Burma Road, and deliver our merchandise via the back door. This done, we could help build up a portion of the Chinese army to a point where it would be effective in engaging the big Jap force, which now holds a large part of China. Uh, but going up to Oledo Road, and it was just a mud, mud track when we went up it at that time. And the, the, uh, the first thing that we had to do was to walk up to Oledo Road, and we walked uh, 110 miles in 10 days. So uh, we're going up the Lido Road, and, and uh, when we hit Burma, we just go a little ways and we take off for the mountains and into the hills. So the first time that we ever hit uh, a battle uh, is at Wallaboom, and I think the 3rd Battalion is the one that really hit it. And it's the first time that I'd ever heard an artillery shell. But the artillery the Japanese was throwing at us was going over our head. And it just made a big hissing noise. The Chinese were pushing down that road all the time. And so what we were supposed to do was cut the road and stop supplies and then run. So after that one, uh, we, uh, they gave us a second mission. My battalion, the second battalion, was supposed to go on down further yet. And um, uh, it would have been almost 40 miles before the Chinese were fighting. It went down that and we had to cross paddy fields. And that's where they raised rice. And uh, we, had, we hit a river and to get to the road, uh, they claim we crossed the river 40 times, back and forth, back and forth. And then they never, the, the guys that was really fighting never really got to the road. But they had enough power with their mortars and everything else to stop the Japanese. And uh, I never saw it, but they tell me that the Japanese charged them. I don't know how many times across an open field and they just mowed them down like that. But anyway, we had to get out of there because they were uh, Japanese coming up the road behind to, to really get to us. So we had to come back exactly the same way, across the river 40 times and cross the paddy, back up to 3,000 feet. And we stayed there that night and the next morning, we went back to a place they call Napunga. And uh, when we got there, uh, they uh, told us to stay there. That's where we was going to have to stay to, to hold the line. But that's the place that my outfit was uh, surrounded for 14 days. But we had K rations, and that the whole campaign, both campaigns, that's mostly what we lived on was K rations. And it's a little box like that. Um, and there's a, a can of stuff in it for the meal, but there's crackers and a D bar and not hardly anything in it, but that's, that's what you live on. You had three of them a day. But that's how we got food all the time. No other way. There was another ration that they they would, we could get a sea ration once in a while, and it was in a can. But they also had a, a mountain ration they called a 10 in one. 10 people could eat out of one box. And it was a little better too. And, and we had one guy, he, he lived to be over 100, uh, uh, Roy Matsumoto. And uh, he was a, uh, American Japanese, and we had all kinds of interpreters. There was with every one of us, every outfit had interpreters. But during the time that we were surrounded, he would crawl out past our lines and listen 
to where they were going to come in next time, and uh, they'd all be set up and ready for them. On Easter Sunday, the 9th of August, uh, 1944, we got relief from the, that. I, I ended up uh, being evacuated. There was a little Piper plane that took you out, and I had malaria. This is the place you've been hearing so much about, the jungle. It's hot, it's sticky and uncomfortable, full of insects as well as the enemy. And uh, when I got to the hospital, uh, they took my temperature, it was 105.6. And I stayed in the hospital for that, but my feet, like everybody else's, they was almost rotted from the water and the mud and everything like that. And there's one story that always goes around, and that's leeches. You know what a leech is? Yeah. You wake up every day with leeches on you. They, they can be any place on you. And um, I used to smoke. I smoked until I was about uh, until 1960 or something like that. And we'd light a cigarette and touch the back end of him, and he'd back right out. But uh, you never want to pull one out off either. Leeches. You've also got to know how to protect yourselves from them. Suppose you're out on a jungle path. Suddenly you notice something on your leg and you discover it's a tick. Don't try to knock it off or pick it off. The tick is a bloodsucker, and if you break off the head, you'll have an infected leg. Take the end of a lighted cigarette or a match and hold it near the tick. It'll pull out by itself when things get too hot. In April, after all the fighting and everything in the mountains and that, in April, of 1945, they told us that we are done and that uh, the Chinese and the British and the Indian was wiping them out, going down to Rangoon and all that. So we go back to Camp Landis. Oh, there's two battalions of black artillery that join us in this Mars task force too. But we go back to Camp Landis and um, Within a month, um, they tell us that uh, we need to take the mules to China because from Michinaw to Kunming, China is 700 miles. And we took a shortcut, which is called uh, uh, the Silk Trail of Marco Polo. And uh, it's a shorter road to, to Kunming. So they flew us to uh, Karachi and uh, we stayed there for, um, I don't know, maybe a month before we got a ship back to the United States. But uh, in about two days, I was shipped to Camp Grant, and uh, I got my discharge on uh, uh, the 8th, and I went home. I must have rode the bus, because uh, it was in Macomb, where we lived. And uh, I was telling the guys today over there, I said, uh, I don't remember anybody talking to me at all. I just got off the bus and walked home. Till I got home, nobody there. <laughs> <clears throat> Later on in years, I used to uh, do field trips for kids. And uh, it was a joy to teach them that you, a piece of iron is like Play-Doh. Uh, you just get it hot and you can do anything with it that you want. And uh, I had a real great time doing things like that. And uh, one time I started a horseshoeing school in Macomb. And uh, it was the fourth horseshoeing school in the United States. And everybody thought I was crazy, but uh, now the University of Illinois owns it the same name, Midwest Horseshoeing School, and it's part of their veterinarian school, and uh, it's over 50 years old that I started. I definitely learned a lot working on this documentary. 
While I made this documentary, I had an entire vision in place where I was going to make it really natural and nature themed, but it did kind of fall flat on that idea because I wanted to focus more on what he was talking about instead of focusing on what I wanted it to be centered around. I couldn't have this documentary focused on what I wanted. I needed it focused on what he did and what he wanted to show people. I enjoyed my time working on this documentary. It was really stressful, obviously. I felt like everything was just coming down on me. I got really anxious I wouldn't be able to finish this. I thought I would have to stop it short. I thought I would just have to quit. I was worried I wasn't putting enough effort into this documentary that everybody else was, or that I wasn't putting quite enough effort that Lester's family would have wanted me to put into this documentary. Hearing his story made me feel like I learned a lot about World War II that I hadn't known before. Both of my grandfathers and my dad did fight in their respective wars. I'm gonna be honest and say I cannot tell you which ones they were, but I didn't know a lot about other jobs you could do in the war. I kind of always just thought it was, you go out on the field and you shoot. That's all that you could do. But taking in Lester's story, I knew that there were now different jobs. And it really made me think, there's a lot more in this war than I really did think that there could be. I thank Lester for telling his story and giving me the opportunity to see that there are different sides. I wish I could thank Lester for what he had done during the war. And I hope that this documentary showcases my appreciation and really my love for what he has done. It really impresses me and it makes me really, really feel accomplished. To have a finished documentary, and to have listened to such an interesting, very interesting story about different sides of the war that I had not known about. I'll have you sit in a chair real quick. I think this thing might have come from India, I don't know. A lot of mileage on this, huh? I still want to make a point that the mules were great, and uh, they don't get the credit that they need, you know, or these, they deserve a credit. 